we have two exciting speakers with us. Um, the topic of today's discussion is Ukraine energy security, war realities, and post-war prospects on the international front line. Just so everyone is aware, this is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube page and archived for future reference. So please share, uh, tweet, um, use this you know, talk in your teaching and your research. We will have question and answer at the end after both of our speakers have presented. And in the meantime, feel free to add questions, comments in the chat. We will get to them, hopefully all of them, uh, after the two presentations. So I also want to mention that all of our Ukrainian programs are open. So check our web pages and do apply for our programs. Our first deadline upcoming is June 30th for our Fulbright Language Teaching Assistant program. Uh, but we also will you know, have more in the fall and in the summer, our student program and scholar program. So you still have time if you're thinking about applying. All right, so without um, further ado, I will introduce our two speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Adrian Prokip. He is the director of, Ener of the energy program at the Ukrainian Institute for the Future, which is an independent think tank based in Kyiv. He is also serving as a senior associate at the Kennan Institute Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC. He has held scholarships in the US and received his PhD in 2010 and habilitation in 2019. On a regular basis, Dr. Proki publishes op-eds in the US and EU, tracking changes and reforms in the Ukrainian energy sector and general changes in the country as well. Adrian Prokip was a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Kennan Institute in 2015-2016. So we welcome Dr. Prokip. You're mute. Okay, yep, there you got it. Yeah, th 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 thanks, Jessica. Uh, so will you introduce Margarita now and then we follow, or should I start speaking right now? If you want to go ahead and present, we'll introduce Margarita before she presents. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I will try to share my screen right now. Um, okay. Uh, so I will try to, to, to speak briefly uh, in order to have more time for Q&A. Uh, and in general, I will speak about uh, the impact of the war on Ukrainian energy. Uh, and uh, I will speak how uh, all related issues, I will start speaking how uh, this impacted on, uh, on, on the Europe and Margarita will uh, continue talking about this. So uh, what we're talking uh, about the impact of uh, the war on Ukrainian energy, it's about impact on energy supply and demand, it's about damages to infrastructure, it's about changes to energy policy and uh, possible threats to, uh, to, to markets, to market reforms uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, uh, from the very beginning of the war, so we, we had de uh, falling demand for electricity, uh, which uh, was between 28-35%, both comparing to uh, February 23 and to uh, the same dates of 2000. 21 and that was, that was uh, defined by three factors first of all that uh, many productions were suspended uh, some later some uh, production facilities were destroyed uh, many people have left their homes so as of today so i saw information that about more than seven million people are abroad uh, and uh, about three or four million people are just uh, uh, displaced persons so sure this also defined um uh power consumption and uh, as well that power generation facilities and power grids were part of them were destroyed as well so as as of today uh the most recent data that five percent of power generation capacities are destroyed and more than third part are located within a non uh controlled uh, areas uh 
so just just uh, just to compare, so how uh, how the hostilities has impacted uh, energy supply? So we have uh, electricity and uh, uh, gas supply sh shortages. So uh, as of uh, mid of the March, uh, about one million of customers were uh, without electricity supply and uh, more than. Uh, and, and about quarter of billion, more than quarter of billion, were without gas uh, supply. But uh, in general, 3.7 million of customers uh, suffered uh, from at least one suffered from uh, power shortages during the war, uh, which means that, uh, that that's not only one million uh, people uh, suffered. And uh, sure, uh, the, the number of uh, customers uh, which were uh, cut off from supply uh, was decreasing as uh, Russians were leaving Kyiv region, Zhitomir, Chernihiv. So uh, now uh, only uh, in south and the eastern regions, uh, people are suffering from uh, power shortages. Uh, uh, well, uh, if uh, talking that um, electricity consumption has fallen 30%, so in terms of gas, it's about uh, two times less is consumed now. And also, uh, distribution gas distribution pipelines were damaged. So, uh, regional gas company, which is a company operating distribution system operators, almost in all regions which were affected by the war. So, they informed that 5,000 kilometers of pipelines were dis damaged. Uh, almost 4,000 of distribution facilities, uh, so buildings, uh, vehicles, uh, and uh, during the war they renewed uh, gas supplies to almost uh, 400,000 of uh, uh, households, but all the day there are new damages and uh, uh, workers of the companies are, renewed, are renewing the um, uh, gas supply to, to customers. Uh, this also affected gas production because the richest uh, gas reserves are located in the eastern regions, uh, the Kharkiv region, which is uh, also affected by the war and not all areas are control controlled right now. So the first day of the full-scale war, uh, gas production has fallen 8% and mid of March it was uh, 15%. Later in April, government uh, has uh, classified data, data uh, on gas production, but so yesterday I saw some new data, but actually I'm not sure, uh, should we trust it? And uh, so um, definitely that some facilities are destroyed, some damaged, some are located within the not controlled territories. And uh, the volume of the gas uh, that Ukraine, in Ukraine we will produce depends on the future developments of the war. Uh, so the, uh, the drop may, may be 15, 20% or maybe even 50%. Uh, 50%. So today or yesterday, uh, many energy ministry uh, so announced their um, focused about like 15% drop. But uh, so again, th this will de develop on uh, th this will depend on uh, develop war developments. And sure, this fall of gas production uh, is um, uh, bringing is face is bringing Ukraine to, to the risk of uh, the winter. Will we have enough gas? Uh, will we will we uh, be capable to buy gas to uh, to pass the wind? But except of this, uh, another problem, uh, another threat is um, that uh, this some infrastructure, especially heat producing facilities, are destroyed. Uh, so uh, so here we have data of two hundred boiler houses, but it seems to me that uh, as of today, these are two hundred and forty, which were in different way damaged. Uh, some uh, cogeneration thermal power plants uh, were destroyed, like uh, here's a picture of uh, Kremenchuk, which uh, this one cannot be renewed. Uh, it was attacked at least twice by Russian missiles, and uh, in Okhverka, uh, cogeneration power plant is destroyed. So all this um, possess a serious risk for uh, for people uh, in the case if uh, there is no opportunity to renew uh, heat supply, or in, in the case if uh, when winter starts, if uh, Russian missiles destroy um, heat-producing facilities just just during the winter, so it's, that's a huge 
a huge threat uh, for, for the country. The same uh, that renewables were under attack last year, renewables were responsible for 13% of the electricity produced, and now 40% uh, of renewable capacities uh, allocated within non-controlled territories, 30% uh, uh, of solar and 90% of wind are actually out of working condition and uh, not always we know about uh, about the damages because not always it's uh, it's possible to to check um, in what condition these are uh, and there is still a risk of stealing these facilities because uh, and uh, this happened and uh, also terrorists from Donbass they announced that they will use some of these facilities for uh, to, to, to use the energy for their own needs. Besides, government has decreased payments to uh, payments of guaranteed feed-in tariff to renewable power producers. So, uh, as of now, these these payments are at the level of 18 percent uh, uh, of the total that they had to receive. And actually, producers are claiming uh, that they are facing the risk of bankruptcy. Uh, the problem that uh, most of uh, renewable facilities are located in the areas of hostilities, uh, uh, to just look at this map, there is a map of located wind power capacities. So each, each uh, this sign um, shows number of wind turbines and total stored capacities in Oblast. So Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast uh, are responsible for, for about 67% of wind power capacities and parts of both this Oblast are not controlled now. So. Uh, the war has um, has attacked uh, renewable power in Ukraine, which actually was a part of uh, European agenda and which was a part of decreasing dependency in Russia. Uh, fuel prices uh, is also the result of uh, of the war. Uh, before the war, Ukraine was deeply dependent on supplies uh, from uh, from Russia, from Belarus. Also, we received some supplies from Kazakhstan, which uh, we, and the, the, this LPG was transited uh, through, through Russian territory. And uh, uh, also, we imported some fuel uh, through the Black Sea to, to Odessa and Usually Terminal. And uh, uh, there was one big refinery operating, Kremenchuk, and a dozen of many refineries. Uh, so uh, sure that uh, uh, invasion was followed with halt in supplies from Belarus and from uh, from Russia, and uh, uh, Russian military fleet also blocked uh, full supplies, uh, sea full supplies, and Russians also uh, three times Russians were attacking uh, Kremenchuk refinery, which was destroyed and is not not operating. A final extent uh, and. During the war, they also were attacking uh, big uh, fuel depots, at least. Uh, so it's about 25 fuel depots were destroyed. So Ukraine faced serious shortages of uh, fuel. Uh, the only fuel consumed in Ukraine was coming. So since the moment when Tomichuk refiner was destroyed, the fuel was coming from um, the side of the European Union. And uh, prices became almost two times higher. And there are still uh, huge lines at nuclear, uh, at, sorry, at, at fuel and stations. Uh, in the case, if uh, there is fuel at the fuel and stations, uh, another very serious threat is uh, that what is called Russia's nuclear terrorism. So, Russia uh, was uh, shooting uh, facilities which contained radioactive materials in Kiev and Kharkiv. Russians seized control over Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Uh, Russians uh, seized control and still have control over Zaporizhian nuclear power plant. And they announced their desire to, to, to disconnect the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant from Ukrainian power system and use the electricity to either to feed an extra media or to just to, uh, to use this electricity in Russia. Uh, and their heart reported about at least 40 billion Remnias losses because of all these uh, actions uh, of Russian army towards Zaporizhia and Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Uh, just to, to, to remind that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the biggest in Europe and the, the third biggest uh, in uh, um, globally. Uh, so uh, this is possessing uh, a risk for nuclear safety. This is possessing risks for uh, operation of Ukrainian power system in the future. 
and uh, about uh, covering uh, electricity needs uh, in the case if you re renew renew the demand. Uh, so, uh, sure that the war has changed energy policy. So, the first, I already mentioned, there was this, the decision to refuse from oil and uh, oil product supplies from Russia and Belarus. Uh, Ukraine also announced its decision to refuse from uh, Russian nuclear fuel because about 50% of nuclear fuel uh, imported uh, came from Russia. Uh, so, uh, the government. Uh, nationalized Russian and Belarusian assets, not all uh, yet. So the process is ongoing and prohibited uh, energy companies uh, from Russia and from Belarus to operate in Ukraine. However, there was no, no changes toward uh, gas and oil transit policy. There were some speculations, uh, both from, from Ukraine and from abroad. But uh, uh, Ukraine demonstrates its desire to continue transit gas and oil to European Union states, unless until the moment Europe says that they do not need this, uh, these resources. So in this case, Ukraine is, is ready to stop the transit. And uh, a very important change, there was fast track disconnection from Russia, Belarus power system and synchronization of U Ukrainian power system with the uh, European power system. So uh, that's happened that, uh, so um, uh, for many years, Ukraine was preparing to be, uh, to, to have integrated its power system to European. And on uh, February uh, 24, that had, uh, uh, Ukraine had to pass uh, such a stress test when Ukraine had to disconnect from Russia and Belarus for a couple of days. But when the war started, uh, government decided uh, not to con connect back to Russia and Belarus and addressed together with Moldova, because Ukraine was parking this, uh, this path uh, together with Moldova, uh, two countries addressed to INSOE, uh, the system, uh, organization of uh, European transmission system operator, uh, to, uh, so that Ukraine and Moldova were synchronized earlier, because uh, according to previous plans, this had to happen in 2023. So in, in, in March, uh, INSOE uh, took a positive decision, and now the whole Ukrainian power system is synchronized with uh, uh, the European power system. And uh, now Ukraine is uh, expecting to grow uh, electricity exports to, to, to Europe because we have, as of now, we had to have um, extra capacity. Traditionally, Ukraine was a net exporter of electricity, but uh, now we anticipate this uh, decision uh, from, that's actually permission from, from the INSOE. Uh, Still, uh, the, the, the big problem is that the war is posing threats to energy markets because for many years Ukraine was uh, conducting reforms, Ukraine was trying to establish uh, these market principles, uh, the same as in the European Union, but all the time government had a temptation to, you know, to over regulate the market and uh, uh, mm, there was uh, a desire to have prices uh, regulated, to have cheap prices. So, uh, in the case, for example, in the case of gas market, uh, Ukrainian households see market prices, real market prices, only for half a year. Uh, and when the gas rally in Europe started, uh, these prices were regulated as well. So now, uh, uh, government is trying to uh, keep prices low, which which actually is natural because. Uh, Many people do not have enough money to pay for, for, for bills, even under today's condition, not talking about the, the market price. But uh, the question is when, uh, uh, so when the war finishes, uh, how many time will we need for, for the recovery uh, by the moment when Ukrainian uh, households are ready uh, to pay the market prices? So uh, th there was a question if, if the war will not affect the market design. Uh, and so how many time will we need uh, for, for the renovation and to establish, you know, free markets, energy markets in Ukraine? So that, that, that's, that's a big question. And uh, the question if, if government uh, will not make a uh, wrong decision, because what we see now that uh, we, we, at the gas market, we see uh, um, increasing concentration of the market. So that, that's, that, that, that's maybe a threat uh, and problem in future. Uh, uh, and just a few words about uh, about uh, Europe. So the European Union and some other states decided uh, took a decision to uh, 
uh, impose sanctions against Russia. Uh, so we already saw uh, oil embargo. Uh, and by the end of the year, as Europe expect, European Union expect, they will uh, decrease uh, imports of Russian oil uh, for 90%. Uh, that was there was uh, Hungary, which was opposing for a full embar total embargo, and uh, you know that so since 2017, Ukraine and Hungary had pretty difficult relations. Uh, probably we will not see um, embargo on natural gas because as of today, um, European Union is not capable, is not ready to uh, refuse from all uh, gas ju just to. Just to understand that, uh, like uh, the volumes that uh, of Russian gas that um, European Union imports is comparable to to, to uh, capacity of LNG terminals that were installed uh, in the European Union before the moment of the war, and uh, natural gas producers are not uh, ready to uh, produce uh, enough gas to, to substitute Russian uh, supplies. And probably uh, Russia will use this to blackmail um, uh, European Union. Actually, that what we are seeing now that uh, Russia has banned uh, Yamal Europe pipeline. Uh, Russia is decreasing um, gas supplies through Ukraine and Russia announced decrease of supplies uh, uh, through the Nord Stream 2. They uh, say that uh, these are sanctions, which are the reason, but they still say that Nord Stream 2 uh, can be used. It's capable to, uh, to carry more gas. And Russians will try to affect the prices because all these uh, decrease of supplies will uh, rise the prices. And as they expect that customers in the European Union will be concerned with rising energy prices, and they will be less interested in, um, in, in Ukraine, uh, in Russian aggression towards Ukraine, and as Russians expect that uh, in this way, government will, will, will pay less attention to, uh, to banning uh, Russian energy exports to, uh, to, to the European Union. So uh, uh, now we're going to... We, we, the situation with the Russian uh, experts is um, it's not very clear. So, Still, it's still it's very important so that uh, European Union and West in general continued its policy to contain Russia using the leverage of uh, banning uh, uh, Russian energy, restricting at least restricting Russian energy supplies. Uh, because in 2014, uh, in Europe was 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 talking about the uh, desire to uh, diversify uh, energy supplies. And even 2015, there was a framework strategy saying about this. But in 2016, we saw the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, agreement. And a year later, we saw uh, an agreement on construction, the Turk Stream uh, pipeline. So uh, I hope that this story will not happen again and uh, that Europe will take these lessons of uh russian aggressive and military tight energy policy so uh here i'm passing the floor to margarita and then we can have q and a &A, probably okay great well what an informative and insightful overview we have um, so much to discuss. And yes, I want to now um, give us a little bit more background about Margarita. Um, oh, just a moment. Let's see. Uh, we'll just pull up her, her information here. Um, meanwhile, we do have uh, some comments in the chat. Um, we will be getting to those later, just food for thought. Uh, one of the questions is what's changed regarding Nord Stream 2 and Balkan Stream projects since February 24. So that's something that maybe we can think about in the context of the next presentation. Um, Dr. Margarita M. Balmaceda is a professor of diplomacy <clears throat> and international relations at Sutton Hall University. Currently, she is also associate at the Harvard Ukraine Research Institute and heads the study group on energy materiality, infrastructure, spatiality, and power at the Hanse 
Weissenschaft colleague in Germany. Her new book is Russian Energy Chains, The Remaking of Technopolitics from Siberia to Ukraine to the European Union. And that's on uh, New York Columbia University Press. She looks at the triangular energy and power relationship involving Ukraine, Russia, and the EU, in particular Germany. Her research analyzes connections between natural resources, international relations, and political developments with special emphasis on energy politics in the metal meteorology sector as well. She is um, looking at her Ukrainian, Russian, Hungarian, and German um, skill set in this work, uh, bringing it to bear, as well as her native Spanish. She has conducted extensive research in Belarus, Lithuania, Moldova, Russia, Hungary, Germany, and Finland. And some of her other books include The Politics of Energy Dependency, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania Between Domestic Oligarchs and Russian Pressure on University of Toronto Press 2013, as well as Living the High Life in Minsk, Russian Energy Rents, Domestic Populism, and Belarus's Impending Crisis. That's on CEU Press 2014. And Energy Dependency Politics and Corruption in Former Soviet Union on Rutledge Press 2008. Um, as well as a, a few more books. Um, she has an international researches and exchange background. Um, she's held an IREX grant, as well as a Fulbright Fellowship in International Security at Belarusian State University in Minsk from 1997 to 1998. And this year we'll have another Fulbright Fellowship, likely based in Germany this fall. So thank you, Dr. Balmaceta, the floor is yours. You're muted. Thank you so much, Jessica. Your work is, work is highly appreciated. And um, I'm also very happy that you're including uh, energy and economic issues in, in this discussion, which are also part, very important part of, of the discussion. So I'll try to share my screen, which given how terrible I am with technology, <laughs> may not work uh, very well, but I will try just one second because um, I need to go to the, um, I'm sorry, I am trying to go to the, to the top of the, of the document so that I can actually, sh um, okay, just one second. Excellent. Yes, so I'm gonna try to follow up from where Andrian uh, stopped and um, perhaps focus a little bit more on the international side of the issue. I'm obviously very interested in domestic Ukrainian politics and energy politics, but perhaps for at least at least some of my slides, I will focus on that international uh, question. And the, the first thing um, I wanted to mention was the, the possible EU oil embargo vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and the Hungarian uh, connection there. I also have a personal connection to Hungary for many years. Uh, so maybe at some other time we could, we could have a discussion specifically on Hungary, but concerning the EU oil embargo or possible oil embargo, uh, as you probably know, Hungary has been the country that has most strongly opposed that embargo. Um, and uh, I simply want to show one slide showing how problematic is this uh, Hungarian position. Uh, basically, the uh, Hungarian position has been that it will have trouble uh, importing oil from other sources. But the reality is, if you look at this slide, it's a Polish slide, but uh, you, you get the main points. The reality is that Hungary has actually been importing oil from the Adriatic Sea, from, from Trieste area, Rijeka, for more than 30 years, because actually already in the 1970s, the Soviet Union, who wanted to export oil to the West, encouraged Hungary and other um, Comic-Con states to import from other sources that, so that the Soviet Union could export. So uh, it's not uh, only a question of what supplies are available. It's a very a uh, complex political question as well. And it's a question having to do with domestic populism in Hungary with the desire of the Orban regime to have some kind of lower 
um, domestic consumer prices to boost their power and also the use of Russia as a counterweight to what they see as Western, um, unacceptable Western liberalism. So it's a very complex issue that is embedded both in the corruption and cronyism within the Orban regime, but also in domestic populism and in very complex Hungarian Russian relations. In, 20 years ago, I wrote a book together with a Polish, a Hungarian, and a Slovak colleague called the Ukrainian Russian Central European Security Triangle. And already then, the complex issue of um, perceptions about minority rights, how they were affecting that relationship was there. And now this issue is being manipulated politically by the Orban regime. So this is just one, one set of issues here. But um, I also want to flag uh, to your attention how uh, we need to look at countries beyond the European Union in order to understand the ability of any European Union policies to move away from Russian natural gas and oil to, the, to prevent the, the Russian regime from getting more and more money from energy exports. We have concentrated a lot on what is happening within the European Union. We have concentrated a lot in what has been happening with the US um, stopping imports of, of Russian fossil fuels, but the question really uh, cannot be answered just by looking at the European Union because what is happening is that because of the nature of some of the energy markets, in particular oil markets and coal markets and LNG markets, a really important role is being played by countries outside the European Union. So um, I, I simply want to flag here that actually Russia has been increasing its fossil fuel export revenue after the war. And this is uh, because of the way these markets work, because of the way in which some types of fossil fuels sold by Russia, which are actually not wanted in the West for political reasons, have found markets elsewhere. And in particular here, I'm talking about certain grades of oil uh, sold by Russia, in particular the Urals type of oil, um, which has lost a lot of um, price vis-a-vis -vis other types of oil, but it's exactly because of that reason um, very keenly sought by other markets. So Russia has increased its revenue from fossil fuel exports after the start of the war. Um, and if you look at it in terms of year to year, we are seeing a more than double increase planned for 2022 compared um, to the previous years here. Uh, we are seeing the current account surplus. So this includes much more than natural gas and oil exports, but it gives you a sense of how uh, actually the attempts to keep that income away from Russia have not really worked uh, fully so far. Um, here, uh, I have another slide where I simply want to uh, flag the, the countries from where that revenue is coming. And again, this is data for the first year, first 100 days after the start of the war. So the largest um, importer in terms of uh, millions of euros is China, especially in terms of imports here in violet crude oil. And again, China is importing a type of crude oil that many Western countries do not want. Western countries are trying to move away from Russian oil, but exactly because of that, that type of oil is being sold at a lower price and countries like China and others are grabbing that uh, to import in, in large scale. So China is the largest, but the second is Germany, uh, which continues uh, not only Not, not only um, pipeline uh, gas supplies through Nord Stream, although of course, as you know, Russia is uh, reducing that supply, but also through the importation of crude oil. Um, one important point to keep in mind is that the European Union in its long discussion about whether to declare a moratorium on purchase of crude oil from Russia, reached 
a kind of very lazy agreement saying we will prohibit the importation of Russian crude oil via tanker, but we will continue importation via pipeline and a lot of the oil imported by Germany comes by pipeline. Um, I also want to um, point to your attention the role of Italy and the role of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is especially important through the importation of crude oil from Russia and also oil products. And this is really important. We have paid a lot of attention to crude oil, but a lot of that crude oil is replaced by oil products like gasoline and diesel. And you may ban the importation of crude oil, but if you keep importing those oil products, then nothing really changes. Um, I'm trying to move to my next slide, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and now if we look at the case of coal, uh, a very interesting country appears in the top. This is Japan. Um, Japan has been, has not really been discussed in terms of Western sanctions against Russia, uh, in terms of a, a moratorium on the purchase of Russian fossil fuels, but Japan is really, really important because Japan is a large importer of Russian coal, Russian liquefied natural gas, and so far, Japan has not taken a decision to stop importing that liquefied natural gas. And in fact, Japan is maintaining its investments in Russian liquefied natural gas facilities. So this is really a very weak point in the Western uh, coalition. Um, and all of this goes back to a couple of technical issues, which I simply want to flag. Uh, oil is heterogeneous. Oil is sold under the name of different brands. So many of you know about Brent brand of oil. Uh, many of you may know about Qatar, but there is also a, other brands that are more difficult to refine or which are refined in refineries that were built exactly to refine those heavier and more sulfur um, contaminated types of oil, such as um, a type of oil that, that Russia produces. And this is really important because what we see is that oil is not oil. You have different brands of oil, different types of oil. Um, historically, the main uh, Russian export in oil, the Urals oil has been sold at a small discount versus the flagship Brent oil. Now that discount has really become much larger, but this has, this has not hurt Russia. This has actually benefited Russia because Russia is selling uh, much larger amounts of that oil. Uh, here is just kind of a technical slide, kind of giving you a sense of how these different types of oil differ in terms of their key characteristics. But again, the point is um, Russia is able to benefit from actually having a larger discount on its, its main oil. And this is a problem for those of us who want those revenues to stop flowing to Russia. Uh, China, India, Sri Lanka have greatly increased their oil purchases from Russia. Um, and the West, the European Union, the US, we need to work with these countries, in particular India and Sri Lanka, um, with which we theoretically have an alliance, but these countries are remaining in the sidelines. They have refused to fully condemn Russia's new wave of aggression against Ukraine, and they are buying large amounts of Russian oil. Uh, so this is really important to keep in mind. However, it cannot simply be an issue of exerting pressure on these countries. It should also be an issue of giving them alternatives. Um, you may know that Sri Lanka is undergoing a huge economic crisis. So it's not simply a question of saying uh, you shall not import Russian oil, but it's a question of offering alternatives. Um, the other uh, very important issue that I want to flag is how another uh, form of delivering natural gas, liquefied natural gas, which many have seen as a kind of miracle weapon against um, over-dependency on Russian natural gas imported by pipeline, 
liquefied natural gas and uh, the building of terminals to receive such liquefied natural gas in Europe is important. It will allow a quick move away from dependence on pipeline supplies from Russia. But what this is creating is her, uh, heavier uh, competition for access to liquefied natural gas from the traditional importers in Asia and Europe. And this, again, is increasing prices. So energy markets are both fragmented and interconnected. And this is going to create new pressure on prices, both in Europe and also in uh, Asia. Amazingly, the competition for energy is also affecting other issues. For example, it's affecting fertilizers. Uh, Russia's criminal policy of preventing Ukrainian grain exports from reaching the world is leading some countries such as Morocco to greatly try to increase their fertilizer production so that they can produce more of their own grain. This is, however, very problematic because um, nitrogen-based fertilizers are a very carbon-heavy product. So this is, again, feeding back into a, another set of issues having to do with climate change and gives you a sense of how complicated and multifaceted the impacts, the global impacts of Russia's new aggression against Ukraine are. Um, I would like to spend a couple of minutes looking at the future and presenting uh, some questions about what Ukraine's role, energy role in the future will be. Andrian very clearly presented some of the very concrete issues and damages created by Russia's military aggression on Ukrainian infrastructure. I want to shift the attention for a moment into a larger issue of what kind of energy role may Ukraine play in, in the future after the world, after the war. But here I want to concentrate your attention on the issue of transit. So basically in the, in the last 30 years, Ukraine based its energy connection to the world on being a transit country for Russian fossil fuels. Transit meaning different things. Um, that we can discuss that in more detail later, but it was a role that was very, very much related to the movement in one form or another of Russian fossil fuels from uh, production in Russia through Ukraine to users, uh, mainly in the European Union. And obviously we know that first and foremost from the case of natural gas, but for many years, Ukraine played a very, very key role in the transit of oil as well, and indirectly in the transit of coal through the use of coal for steel production. Um, this is a role which affected Ukraine's infrastructure. It affected Ukraine's politics through the development of certain actors, elite actors, oligarchic actors, which had a particular interest in that transit and basically meant that many actors in Ukraine had a really strong vested interest in participating basically in the export chains of Russian fossil fuels in what I call in, in, in my last book, latest book, Russian energy chains. This is going to have to change because the European Union possibly will move away from those Russian fossil fuels, but also because through this new Russian aggression, we have seen the other side of that situation. Ukrainian actors, as well as German actors and other EU actors benefited tremendously from participation in those Russian energy chains. But the other side of the medal was that that dependency came at a very high political price, which we are seeing every day. So what may this be. Um, Ukraine in a post-Russian energy chains world 
in electricity, we are already seeing very important steps in that direction through uh, the unexpectedly quick connection to the ENSO Western European platform. This is something that Andrian discussed a few minutes ago, and that is going well. However, um, Ukraine's role as an exporter of electricity to the European market may be complicated by a number of environmental regulations, which I will mention in a moment. In the case of natural gas, this is going to be very, very um, complicated. So far, the formal Ukrainian position is that the European Union states should move away from Russian natural gas. But if they continue to import that Russian natural gas, then it should flow through Ukraine. Um, this is a very complicated um, and in some senses contradictory position. Some of those contradictions I already discussed in my book, although of course it was written before the war. Um, but the question is, what role can Ukraine play? What role can Ukraine's very extensive and complex and nuanced natural gas transit infrastructure play should the European Union stop importing Russian natural gas? Uh, and here, this is uh, one uh, picture from my book, it's a little bit schematized view of the Western Ukrainian um, nat natural gas transit infrastructure. But the point is that during those 50 years, 40 plus years, in which Western Euro Europe has been importing Soviet and then Russian natural gas, Ukraine's natural gas transit infrastructure played a very, very key role in making possible the safe transit of that natural gas. Ukraine has a unique asset, which are the largest natural gas storage areas in Europe. They are located very close to the Polish and Slovak border. Ukraine, because of the diversity and multiplicity of pipelines can play a very important, together with those storages, played a very important role in the regulation of pressure in the pipeline. That is really essential because if you don't regulate the pressure, you can have an explosion. So how can Ukraine use that infrastructure in the future in a world that may not be a world of large scale natural gas imports from Russia? Or may we suggest that that transit continues, that that supply continues, but under new contractual conditions where Russia will be given less power? Or could Ukraine perhaps concentrate its role as a provider of storage facilities, not so much transit? Uh, or could those pipelines be used for the storage and transmission of hydrogen, for example? Will we see a situation where Ukraine will be no longer receiving natural gas from Russia for transit or use, but rather become part of a larger um, Western European market? Those are still open questions. Uh, in the case of, of oil, and I'm sorry, I have a, a, a typo here, um, two typos, three typos. Um, Will Ukraine be able to move away from dependency not only on crude oil, but on oil products, which it has traditionally been buying from Belarus and Russia? How can Ukraine do this when it no longer has any refineries um, standing? This is a key issue. Um, especially important is the issue of how can Ukraine move to a post-transit world in the area of coal? In July of last year, Germany and the US opened a green fund for Ukraine to basically give Ukraine a, a compensation gift for agreeing to the use of Nord Stream 2, which of course never happened. And the green fund for Ukraine, which has been very heavily underfunded, however, this uh, Green Fund of Ukraine had as its mission to help Ukraine move away from coal. Uh, can this be done? Will this be done? 
And this is in turn very much related to what I call the coal, coal, oil, uh, coal, steel, coal steel nexus, because coal has two roles. It can be used for simply the production of electricity, of course, a very environmentally problematic production of electricity, but it's also produced um, for the um, for use as coke, as coking coal in the blast furnace for the production of steel. Historically, the steel sector has been a very, very important source of revenue for Ukraine. And in fact, it is exactly because of this that both the US and the EU have recently given Ukraine um, one year of duty-free imports um, for its steel. All of you are familiar, of course, with Azovstal as a bastion of Ukrainian resistance and as a destroyed steel factory, but there are other steel factories in Ukraine still working. And it is hoped that by allowing those steel exports to uh, reach the US and the EU market duty-free, that may help the Ukrainian economy at this very complex period. Um, the destruction of factories such as Azovstal may also bring the possibility of rebuilding uh, these steel facilities using greener technology, which would be something very important because Ukraine so far has been using some of the most old fashioned and most CO2 intensive um, steel technologies in the world. However, this creates a new set of issues for Ukraine, not only because some of the raw materials used for steel production may be in areas which are not under Kyiv control, but also because if you move to greener technology, which is not based on coal, for example, um, he, the traditional advantages that Ukraine held for the production cycle of steel may not be there. And moreover, uh, the European Union is currently discussing a new type of duties on carbon intensive products such as steel, the so-called cross-border adjustment mechanism, which may have a very, very big impact on, on Ukraine's ability to export in the future. Um, if you look at this slide, uh, this is a slide, sorry, um, showing, uh, showing the different countries that would be affected by this new type of European Union cross-border adjustment tax, you will see that Ukraine uh, would be one of the most affected. And in particular, it would be through Ukrainian exports of steel and Ukrainian exports of fertilizers, Ukrainian exports of aluminum, Ukrainian, sorry, and Ukrainian exports of electricity. This is a really, really uh, complex issue made even more complicated with the war. Uh, this takes me to a small uh, aside about my Fulbright project. I was hoping to be in Ukraine next year to work on a project on steel technology, oligarchs, and political development. I will not be able to do that, but I have a tentative agreement to do this project at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And they have a wonderful project on industrial decarbonization. So I may spend less time interviewing oligarchs but actually learning something that may be useful for Ukraine in the future. So I just want to thank you and thank all the people who have supported my work on this. And if you want to be in touch with uh, some of my current ideas, you may uh, subscribe to my Twitter account. So thank you. I don't know if Andrea wants to make some uh, further comments or whether we may want to go directly to the uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Margarita. So I'll have a couple of comments uh just a few very short yeah uh, regarding this issue that how ukraine was deeply dependent on belarusian oil products and how this may be sold actually uh there are option of solutions uh, especially like modernization of existing uh some of existing refiners which are actually still able to be modernized there was the question of political will there was the question of uh, the process where we're working, uh, that everything was working properly. I mean, the imports was flowing, 
uh, and some people were making money on these import flows and uh, there was no uh, desire for some uh, decision makers to change the situation. However, even last year we were discussing this and, and we, we were uh, saying what happens if the full scale war starts and uh, and the Belarus cut off supplies and the Russia as well and um, supplies to Odessa will stop. So we were talking about this uh, and we were so we, we saw the options how to uh, deal with this. Yes, um, most likely that Ukraine will not see any transit, both uh, gas and oil, after current uh, contracts expire. Uh, either um, Europe will cut, decrease, decrease uh, these imports uh, from Russia, or uh, Russia will not uh, be able to sign these contracts with Ukraine. But, but that's very likely. The situation is very likely. Uh, uh, regarding electricity experts, uh, I, I'm still pretty optimistic because uh, this insoe synchronization has, has changed a lot. Because before, uh, before the April, uh, all uh, carbon zero, most of carbon zero capacities were not uh, synchronized to Europe, and there was the, the only power station that was exporting electricity that was Bursting, uh Thermal power plant, which was using coal, and uh, as of the last year, seventy percent of electricity were carbon zero, and it looks like the euro will will tolerate nuclear power for for, for decade or two decades, uh, and uh, so there is still an option for Ukraine to export uh, carbon zero electricity, which is of high demand in Europe. Um, uh, but 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 that's true that the CBAM mechanism uh, had to affect Ukrainian chemical and uh, and, and still uh, producing industries. The question is that we do not know uh, what will be the economy uh, after the war because we don't not do not know when the war uh, finished, uh, where, and what will be the damages. But still, uh, uh, Ukraine will have to renovate after the war in any case, and this is uh, opening. Uh, window of opportunities that we would modernize uh, Ukrainian uh, industrial sector and Ukrainian energy. Uh, so, uh, but but still we have so many uncertainties uh, about the future. Yeah. So the, the, those were my, my my short comments. Do we have any audience members who would like to pose any questions? before we get to the chat. We have one question in the chat from Yehor Brailian. What has changed regarding the Nord Stream 2 and Balkan Stream projects since February 24? I think some of uh, our speakers' comments have addressed this, but maybe you want to return to it. Yeah, well, uh, regarding the Nord Stream 2, uh, sanctions were imposed and uh, the company operating the Nord Stream 2 uh, became a bankrupt. So, uh, but, but still the pipeline is under the, 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 the Baltic Sea. Uh, and uh, uh, today, because from CEO Miller, uh, so, so they're they playing transit games so because they banned uh, Yamal Europe. They do not uh, use uh, all capacity they pay for Ukrainian transit. They say that they cannot use Nord Stream 1 because of sanctions, because of these sanctions, uh, there is, uh, one uh, turbine uh, has stuck somewhere in Canada and they cannot receive this turbine and that's why they can use uh, Nord Stream 1 at full capacity. That's why they are decreasing the gas flows to Europe and Europe is facing new uh, spikes of uh, gas prices. And they say, we, we're not guilty that because of the sanctions, but they say still there is an option to use uh, Nord Stream 2. Uh, so uh, that was expected that they will play this game to blackmail and uh, to, to talk about the Nord Stream 2. Uh, but also they are, they're trying to impact the prices because uh, having uh, very high prices, they will try to compensate uh, some, uh, some re revenues they will lose because of less supplies, because of Poland, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Finland, uh, Netherlands. Uh, they cut supplies uh, 
uh, so that is the situation. Maybe Margarita has to add something. I would like to add that, I mean, like very clearly Andrea noted, Russia is playing a blackmail. And the blackmail is not just like we will cut, it's not just we will totally cut supplies. It's something they started to do in October of last year. We will reduce supplies so that the prices uh, increase and then people get like even more worried about, you know, what to do if we don't have access to the Russian supplies. Concerning Nord Stream 2, um, yes, there was a decision not to use it. It's still there. Two things are really important. Both Nord Stream 1 and into a sense Nord Stream 2 involved not only clearly corrupt actors such as Gerhard Schroeder, the former German chancellor who immediately after he left uh, the job started to work for Gazprom, they involved not only that, but they involved many, 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 many other actors in Germany. And one thing I, I regret, you know, that I didn't really go into that in detail in my book, um, but for example, I spent a year in Greifswald, and I know that Jessica, you will go there for the Ukrainian economy. I was, I was just there uh, speaking to some of our common uh, colleagues there. Um, I was in Greifswald when Nord Stream 1 was open, when, when it was inaugurated. The city was empty because they were all celebrating this. Now it has come to, the, to light that the entire government of that province of Germany, Mac, Mecklenburg for Pormen, was totally implicated. They even created a special foundation to make sure that some of those businessmen would avoid sanctions. So what I'm trying to say is there are many, many people involved in this. It's not just traditional corruption, it's a variety of interests. Why is this important? Because look at what happened in 2014. A lot of talk, and then they go back to increase their dependency on Russian fossil fuels. There's another element we should not forget about Nord Stream 2. There is the whole issue of all possible judicial proceedings and lawsuits about who will pay for the quote unquote damages for not using that pipeline. And I can assure you that there are many, many lawyers who are involved there. I, don't, I doubt that Nord Stream 2 will be used, but those people and those lawyers are at the ready. And um, that's just simply to, something to keep in mind. Uh, and then do you want to say something about the Balkan, the Trans-Balkan pipeline? Uh, the, the part going from Ukraine to uh, no, the, the Moldova? One, no, no or, the, one, the one going through the uh, Black Sea. Uh, well, it seems to me there were no specific serious uh, developments regarding the, the pipeline. So it's partly it's used. Uh, it was used so last year even uh, it uh, uh, supplied more than in 2020 and in 2022 there was uh, there were no restriction uh, towards the pipeline if I'm not wrong yeah We have another question from Maria Neatishin. Are Belarusian and Russian energy systems unified? Um, may I ask whether um, it's meant like electricity or is it meant um, oil or natural gas? Maria, maybe you can specify which type of energy system. Or, or all of them? Mm -hmm. Maybe generally. Okay, so so yes, the electricity uh, sectors, uh, they are unified. Now concerning natural gas and oil, it's really, really interesting because they are unified in some ways, but in some ways they are not. And just like the entire saga of the Belarusian-Russian relationship where they quote unquote had a union state that didn't really exist in reality. so. This kind of unified system, but not really unified, is really important because that kind of gray zone allowed Belarus, allowed Lukashenko to make millions. So I wrote a book on Belarus, which you mentioned. That book is exactly about how Mr. Lukashenko used those, that gray zone to import to Belarus duty-free Russian oil in the process 
allowing certain Russian oligarchs to make a lot of money, and then exporting this to the Netherlands and then to the rest of Europe. So they are kind of unified, but not fully unified. And that's perfect for Lukashenko, or it was, because it allowed him to manipulate that, to make a lot of money, to be able to keep the Belarusian miracle on. Um, unfortunately, the Belarusian miracle is no longer really working very well, but it, it made uh, him very dependent on Russia at a political level as well. So that's my, my answer to that. More questions, comments? I guess I, I will add a, a question. Um, Natalia says, thank you. Natalia Kutsokon says, thank you for the wonderful presentations. Um, I have a question about, I guess, vulnerabilities um, if energy electric systems are connected between Russia, Belarus, um, and also in Ukraine now, knowing that the famous hacking of the grid of the electrical station north of Kiev, I believe it was in 2015, 2014, um, since that time, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, lots of lessons have been learned in, in how to protect the grid or upgrade it in different ways. Um, I guess uh, for the non-expert, what does the future look like for Ukraine's energy grid electrically getting away from Belarus and Russia and protecting it from, from hackers? Can it be more integrated with the European grid? Um, are these... Are these valid questions? Well, it, it, it is now integrated with the European grid, which is amazing. But I think Andrian is the person for this. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So it is it is integrated now, uh, but uh, in short, uh, as Ukraine became a member of NSOE, this organization of transmission system operators from Europe, uh, Ukrainian transmission system operator has more uh, access to study lessons of European countries how to protect the system. But uh, that's true that uh, um, cybersecurity approaches have 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 uh, have been changed in a in a better way since 2016 when there was a attack on the party Oblonerho. But even before before the war, so just week uh, ten days before the war, we experienced a serious uh, cyber attacks, including on uh, uh, distribution uh, system operators. Uh, but uh, so the, the same as uh, hackers uh, improve their uh, their technologies every day, and uh, cyber security um, specialists do this as well. So, uh, well, a good thing from the point of Ukrainian energy is there is uh, the the level of. Uh, of um, using IT technologies is, is not so uh, high as in some other European countries. In, in, in some cases, that was that was saving, uh, but but still, um, so still Ukraine is doing a good uh, a good job in, in protection of uh, the system from the point of uh, cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Margarita, you're muted. Yes, I'm just. I just have like a crazy question, maybe for Anne. Oh, you're muted. Um, so Ukraine has connected its grid to Enso. Russia has uh, is temporarily controlling some parts of Ukrainian territory. What is Russia going to try to disconnect those parts of the Ukrainian territory from? Uh yeah, that, that's a sophisticated question. So they they uh, they didn't announce specific uh, plans what they're going to do, but they said that they want to use uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, for example. And there is Zaporizhia thermal power plant, which is next next to a nuclear power plant. Uh, so the, the question is how technically they are going to do this. So uh, from as an option, it, it's it's it can be done as disconnecting a part. Uh, from this of the system from the Ukrainian power system, but uh, months of testings and modeling has to be done, uh, and uh, they have to check if uh, the if the Russian power system is going to be adequate 
if they connect uh, these power generation facilities uh, to their power system. Definitely that uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is, uh, is too much for Crimea. Uh, and uh, so technically it's, it's extremely difficult task, but, uh, and especially in, in the wartime, it's much more complicated because uh, all this uh, stability of the power system can be destroyed with um, with the military attack. So another option they would they can be do uh, which can they do is like uh, building a power line, also using existing power lines, uh, for example, either to the direction of Donbas or to the direction of Nova Kachovka. Uh, and using um, DC uh, interconnection, but uh, this again may be uh, may be destroyed with the military uh, leverages. Like uh, so, all these constructions can be destroyed. Uh, so that's true that all these uh, Russians are, are checking at some uh, power stations in the Parisian nuclear power plant and. Uh, they are visiting um, substations to check uh, the options of uh, connecting these generation facilities to, uh, to, to, to Crimea, to, to Donbass, to the Russian power system. They do this, but uh, as of now, there is no much success. Uh, and and the, so some information that, that I don't know that give, gives me a hope that they will not be successful. We have a question in the chat from Edward Balashov. What do you think about the latest news about Russia taking over control over Zaporizhia NPP? How is it possible technically and is it possible? Andrea? Yeah, well, actually, there are, uh, Russian militants who uh, who actually take Ukrainian personnel as the hostages, uh, some were injured and some were kidnapped. By the way, and looks it's true that some people were also killed. Uh, so they are keeping this uh, Ukrainian nuclear power plant personnel as the hostages. Also, there there are people from Rosatom uh, who are trying to. Uh, to get technical information about how everything was uh, working with, including with U.S. Western House nuclear fuel. And uh, at substations, uh, these people are trying to uh, uh, understand the schemes of connections. So how the, that is, was how it was working uh, from the in engineer side. Uh, uh, so that how it is going on uh so i already said if it's technically possible uh, it, it's impossible just to uh, to have a separate line because uh, these zones are uh synchronized in different way uh but so they can look for an option uh, how to disconnect a part from the ukrainian power system which which is extremely difficult and uh, probably which is impossible to be done during the war. Um, so that, that's, that's the answer. He says, thank you. Uh, do we have additional questions or, or comments? Um, Margarita, you may be muted. Yes. Are you... uh, yeah. I, I think one 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 thing that maybe we should um, kind of bring into the discussion is how is the discussion about giving Ukraine a candidate status to the EU going to affect its energy market and its energy reforms? So one of the kind of predecessors to this was Ukraine joining the EU energy community. Um, which kind of um, committed Ukraine to abide by certain principles of the organization of the market. Some of that is very technical. Um, at the same time, Andrian has, and you know, that, that doesn't necessarily deal directly with the question of subsidies or price limits, but it deals with some other issues. 
And I wonder how, and I, this is a, a question for Andrea, and how does the, the stress of having to make sure that families can afford electricity and natural gas, how is that affecting Ukraine's ability to comply with uh, some of those commitments? I mean, I'm talking about the energy community, but of course, this is totally related to the candidate status, which hopefully we'll hear about, I believe, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. As, as I mentioned, so, uh, well, we we joined uh, energy community in 2010. So, and in the first couple of years, there was all, there was no specific success. And uh, some more, well, much more success was since 2014. Uh, but uh, the problem of uh, cross subsidization and uh, no market um, tariffs for, 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 for households, uh, these problems was always in Ukraine and energy community was always uh, stressing about this. So in 2020, in mid 2020, Ukraine introduced when uh, gas prices in, in Europe were extremely low. Uh, so Ukraine introduced uh, this market price for households, and uh, uh, it was market till the end of the year, and then the, the spike, gas uh, price spike started, and government regulated the price for three months, and after that, uh, uh, NAFTA has introduced a year tariff, so uh, like the same price during the year. At that moment, it seems to be that this price will be market one, because that was pretty high. But as, as we had the gas rally, this price tend to be like three, four, five times less than a market price. Uh, so, uh, well, energy community always stressed and, and European Union uh, representatives always stress the necessity to have a um, market price. Uh, but I suspect that, so during the war and during the post-war um, renovation, uh, this issue will be not so um, will be not such a sticking point for uh, for for Ukrainian uh, energy reforms, uh, but but this is very important for you know for building this market design European market design, because as of now uh, the situation well lack of market price is bringing to to the, another problem that so last year. NAFTA has uh, signed uh, contracts with uh, so-called independent suppliers. So NAFTA has was selling yes, a cheap price, and uh, and suppliers were, were supplying it at the same cheap price to households. So this time uh, NAFTA has didn't sign uh, this uh, trading contract. So independent suppliers claimed that uh, that was governmental. Um, decree which did, caused some problems in signing these contracts. So, at, at final extent, today NAFTA has is going to be a guest supplier to about 90% of households. So, at final extent, uh, so also uh, state arrested um, property uh, rights for gas distribution system operators, which were owned by Fiftash. Um, and these were transferred, uh, management of these assets were transferred to Chernomor Naftahas, which is actually a subsidiary of uh, Naftahas. So, and uh, we have such a strange situation when uh, Naftahas uh, uh, will control most of the gas market, so except of the gas uh, transit, so which is uh, a separate company is responsible for this. So, but uh, that is a strange situation that now uh, we have a very huge company, Naftahas, which controls huge part of the gas market and that was the the point of the beginning of the reform uh 10 years ago we were talking about necessity to have transferred market competitive market with uh, with dozens of uh, independent um participants uh so uh oh, okay that is the war but how should we solve the problem uh, with uh, transparency and competition after the war and uh, so the, the market price is 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 extremely uh, important to to have a not concentrated market. So that that's so we, we are going far far behind the, the this problem of cross subsidization, 
but uh, we are talking about the problem of uh, effective transport market. And similar situation was with electricity because there were some attempts to introduce, uh, to, to even not to introduce a market price, but just to increase price. But, but in fact, today uh, we have almost the same price as we had in 2017. And uh, it's clear that inflation was, so I'm not sure uh, what is uh, the inflation uh, since 2017 up to today, but last year it was about 50%. And salaries were increasing, and fuel was increasing prices. But, but the, the price that households paid for electricity remained the same. Uh, that's sure. That's not the way to have efficient energy sector. And that, that is the problem, actually. Um, I, I I realize that there is a question about the oligarchs uh, in the chat. Yes. How um, has I, the so go ahead, go ahead. Just read it out for the audience. Yeah. How has the full-scale invasion of Russia affected the oligarchs control over the energy sector of Ukraine? This is from Yehor Bralion. Yeah, so I, I leave the details for Andrian because he's more he's on the ground, but I want to simply flag something. Look at 2014. Um, Ukraine was in crisis because of Russian invasion. And there you saw very clearly the, the tension between the need to mobilize all resources, including those held by the oligarchs and the oligarchs long-term damage to Ukraine. Um, and you know exactly, for example, the role of Kolomoisky and how his de facto control over uh, Transnafta played a negative role, um, how uh, that, that developed. So, I hope that the news I have heard from Andrian about the way the assets held by Furtash have been dealt with, I hope that it tells me that uh, there will be a different um, balance this time, although the, obviously the emergency is much higher. So I don't, I don't know all the details, but I just wanted to flag this as an, as an important issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 thanks. Uh... Mm, how affected the oligarchs control so uh, I would say that oligarchs didn't obtain more control over en the energy sector uh, during the war and because of the war uh, the clear thing that some oligarchs lost uh, some of their assets so uh, so most of so sure most of all that's uh, about Renat Akhmetov uh, who, who is uh, the, the most uh, influential uh, oligarchs in the energy sector. So, but he uh, he lost control over some uh, uh, coal power plants uh, in east, in south. Uh, sure, we can also mention that uh, that he his SKM lost some assets in metallurgy. So probably this makes him uh, less. Um, less rich and less uh, influential in the energy sector as of now. So we do not know about uh, uh, their plans um, after the war, about the plans of renovation. Um, so Ihor Kolomoisky, so uh, he, he didn't uh, had much effect before the war and he's, um, he's not a so he, he, he was a player um, uh, about some uh, corruption, rent seeking uh, with, with uh, guests for vehicles uh, during this period of serious shortage. So they managed to uh, to earn extra revenues, not in a transparent way, with trading this uh, gas, uh, vehicle gas, but um, that's not a big issue comparing to all other things. And so I already mentioned the Firtash. So that was the State Bureau of, uh, Bureau of uh, Investigations that uh, arrested uh, ownership rights for the DCOs, yes, DCOs that he owned, uh, but uh, not much clear because all these registries are closed because of the war. And uh, so I, I think that that's not the end of the story. Uh, we will see some developments. 
So now Napta has, has to manage these assets. So uh, the, the, the conclusion is that oligarchs didn't become more uh, influential. So uh, they are losing their assets and losing power. So, but th that is the question, uh, what will be after the war? What will be at the, at the moment of the renovation? I just wanted to mention also that some of these oligarchs are also going up. Oh, am I muted? No. Uh, they are very important because they, they also have assets outside Ukraine. So one part of the story, let, let's stay with Akhmetov, who's very important for my work, obviously. Um, he has, you know, the steel plants, the coal mines, um, a lot of things. Some are under, you know, the control of the of the terroristic regimes in in. in in LNR and NR, some are whatever, but he also has assets in the UK, in the US, in Italy. So these people have a kind of a larger picture and how that picture develop will also affect what role they give to their assets in Ukraine within that larger context. So I don't know the answers, but I think this is something we need to keep um, in our radar for the future. Definitely, definitely important. Um, do we have more questions or comments? We're almost out of time, so we can take one more from the audience. Any burning last question? There's so much here. Um, I think we're all waiting to see what the results of the discussions um, taking place today will be tomorrow. And um, hopefully we can see a freer, um, more vibrant Ukraine um, and also, as we have named this talk, the international front line, uh, that the rest of the world, the, the, you know, the whole continent of the EU um, and, and also the US and Canada can recognize this is an, an, internet, this is an international discussion about energy that um, without Ukraine, uh, we would not have uh, lights and transport in Germany and other places. So, Thank you so much to everyone here. Um, and Yehor Bralian says, thanks for the answers. Yes, our oligarchs have the global assets. Um, <laughs> well, I won't uh, argue with you there, but I do hope that um, all of us have learned invaluable lessons today from Dr. Balmasada and Dr. Prokip that we can take with us into our discussions in our communities, families, schools. Um, and remain critical of the energy we consume. Uh, as democratic subjects, we, sh we should know where it comes from and, and remain vigilant. So thank you, everybody. Uh, please stay in touch with us. Bring us your ideas for future discussions and panels. Uh, we do have more coming up. So follow us on Facebook and YouTube. And I want to say thank you very much to our speakers. Um, have a wonderful afternoon and weekend so thank you thank you, thank you full red ukraine thank you bye-bye bye-bye